Welcome everyone to Public Pitch at Dev Gum Fall 2021. For those who are with us first time, I will remind you, Public Pitch is a special activity at Dev Gum where experts evaluate pitches from different perspectives, indicate common mistakes that developers make and provide advice on how to improve the pitch. So, when the real-time opportunity comes to pitch to the publisher or investor of your dreams, you will be ready. The first stage of public pitch will take place live on YouTube, right here, right now, and will happen throughout the next weeks each Wednesday, uh, with different experts that will review four pitches and select the winner that will join the final stage. Um, each time we will pick a pitch that has the most room for improvement. And the finals will happen on November 8th during the DevGum Fall 2021. Only four contestants will get the chance to pitch live in front of a conference audience and win valuable prizes. So, without further ado, let's meet our experts today. Andre, please. Yeah, hey everyone, I'll go first. Um, I am Andre Podoprigara. Uh, I am the executive producer at TinyBuild. And um, I am responsible for the publishing pipeline in the in the company. Tiny Build, for those who don't know, is a is an indie games label uh, that has been around for some time. So before that, I was a game developer on my own. Uh, I also ran a studio that was focusing on mobile. And right now, I'm happy to be here and um, seeing what the what the developers have brought us to pitch. Thanks, Andre. Karina, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here again. Uh, not the first time, but as always, a huge pleasure. Uh, I'm working in gaming industry for five years. And uh, during this time, I've been working for outsourcing companies, for publishers. And I'm, now I'm working for remote control productions, which is developer site. We are the biggest uh, European house of indie game developers. And yeah, I'm looking forward to checking your projects and good luck to everyone. Thanks. And finally, Oleg. Hello, my name is Oleg. I've worked at Meta Publishing. Uh, that's a company that specializes in premium indie games publishing on PC and consoles. Uh, and my role is a director of business development and I look for new projects uh, available for global publishing. Uh, I'm involved in publishing and business development activities since uh, early notice. Uh, worked with uh, many in many Russian and international companies. Uh, was dealing with localization, uh, local publishing, uh, business development. So still uh, in the industry and still enjoying new games. Well, that's our experts for today. And let's see our first project. It's called School of Magic by developer Part-Time Indie and the presenter Nicholas Creasy. Hello and welcome. My name is Nicholas Creasy and today I'm going to pitch you my game School of Magic. School of Magic is a mashup of a hack and slash and a deck building game mixed in with some light roguelite elements. So um, what I want to achieve with this game is basically to make the game that I wanted Diablo 2 to be. What do I mean by that? Basically I really enjoyed how the leveling works in Diablo 2 and I um, enjoyed thinking about the leveling, but I really disliked um, the end of game grinding for gear stuff. That was not really my focus, so I completely cut this part out. And um, I replaced the leveling system with a procedural leveling system because um, you need some randomness in it, and that's where I got the latest Spire influence. Um, so um, if you take a look here now, you can see that at the first level you get three random spells. These are the semi-random, as I call them, because the first two of these spells will always be basic attacks, of a pool of basic attacks, but always be basic attacks. And the third one is a third spell, just to give you context on what to pick. And because I don't have much time, I will go over them quickly. So um, this is um, a spell that um, just attacks an enemy and burns them. And this is a spell that attacks an enemy and poisons them. Poison does reduce the damage the enemy does. Um, if an enemy gets burned, it get, takes damage over time. So I will take this one because I want to have the demo done a little bit quicker. Also, you can see here now, you can walk around, you can destroy some crates or whatever, and barrels, I guess it's called. And here is actually a real crate, so we can destroy this one, and soon we will find our first enemy. 
and you should not be surprised um, by how easy the enemy will be because basically um, I made them pretty easy um, for the sake of this demo. So that's the first enemy, I will one shot kill him, I will destroy his face a little bit and then I will continue to talk a little bit about the leveling system because um, there's more to the leveling system. So in the second level you see now that I lost one spell and I leveled up another. What does, le what does level up mean, mean and how does this all work? So um, first of all, um, leveling up means just the stats increase or get better. So in this case, you can see increase your damage by 4% is the current level. And to the left, you see level 3 will mean by 5% and level 4 will mean by 6%. And then also I've got three new spells. So that means you, with every le level, you lose one spell, you level up all the remaining spells, and then you will get three new ones. What that does is that um, you maybe want to wait for your better spells to level up a little bit more but then you always run the risk of actually losing the spell. So it's a little bit of a push and pull. So um, also, obviously, like some spells are better earlier um, to pick up like this one whenever you level up. Um, this will obviously be better if you um, pick it earlier because you just level up uh, more often at the beginning than later. So I will continue to walk a little bit around here. I probably will find some more enemies soon. And then I will explain you the last part of the leveling system. So here. Actually, you can see now here, once again, we lost a random spell. It is just um, by coincidence that it's always the most left one. It doesn't need to be always the most left one, it's a random one. Then I leveled up the two remaining spells here, so these are both level two now, and you get three new ones here. So the last part um, of the leveling system is this wheel here. I always just um, pick the learn stuff here, but what this actually does is you can actually sell spells and also level them up for gold. So selling spells will just give you 300 flat, flat gold, and but once again you increase the chance of actually removing a card you like because at the beginning of each level up you will lose a random spell. So even obviously you, you will not remove a spell you need, you still increase the chance of actually losing the spell you really want to have. So you always need to think about that. And the next thing is leveling up. Leveling up is not a flat fee, it works a little bit different. Um, it's costing as much gold as the um, level of the card has times 100. So basically, a level 1 card costs 100, and a level 2 card costs 200 to level up, as you can see here, and a level 3 card would cost 300, and so on and so forth. So um, now that we have that, um, I'm out of the way. Um, I think I can just pick pick a spell, um, just so we have pick one, and then I will show you um, another part of the game, another strategic part of the game, which is basically the encounters. These encounters work very similar to um, encounters like um, Slay the Spire or like Faster Than Light or other roguelikes. Basically, you will always get like a decision. These decisions will always give you a card. So in this case, you can think about do you really want to have your cooldowns reduced um, by 10%, but also your damage reduced by 10%. So it's always not, it's not, it might not be clear if you really want that. It also depends on when you get it and what other cards you actually have. So you always need to think about it, and um, here you can just select, and the rest here is just flavor text. So if I say, let's find out, I actually get the card. If I select the other option, I would not get this card. Okay, if you wondered what happened, so I just um, cut to the hub area again, because basically I'm done telling you about um, the stuff that happens inside the game. There's also a meta game, I want to take a quick look. So um, in this game, um, whenever you die, you will get back to this main area and you can start your um, your exam here. And you, right now there are two things you can do in the meta game. This is just a way to actually buy um, to actually buy more spells. So as you can see here, this is a very normal thing. Like you see here, I have right now seven knowledge. Um, I can buy this spell or this spell for nine or twelve. I don't really have enough. But I could also unlock um, three more spells for four knowledge, so I will do that. So I actually have now um, three more spells that I could buy from. And how does it work with buying these spells? Well, this is now where um, uh, basically there's some inspiration from games like um, Magic the Gathering, like CCGs. And what you see here is basically the deck editor. Um, so these are the cards that you can that you can find during a run. And you need to select which cards you want to take with. This is basically a replacement of the traditional mage, warrior, and, and stuff. So instead of like having like these different um, characters, I have like this deck editor thing 
which should give the players more stuff to think about between games and also like they can exchange more. This is going also more alongside of really like having a build like you also would like in Diablo where you say, oh, I have the fire build where you just um, pick all fire spells or whatever. And so um, that's what this is meant to be. So I think that's it. This is the prologue, the demo, so um, it can be played right now on Steam. Uh, anyway, so that's it. Okay. Seems like the pitch is over, so now each expert will provide feedback. It's the usual. What was good, what was bad, and what was should be improved. Be improved. Uh, let's, let's go, go with, with the it. reverse introduction order. So, Oleg, please start. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for the pitch. Uh, I'll start with good things. Uh, well, it was good to see the gameplay video demonstrating different game modes, exploration, uh, deck building, deck editor, and a lot of things. Uh, you know, I almost played the game myself while watching this video with your comments. But what I miss in the pitch is actually quite a lot of uh, useful information, which is uh, usually actually necessary for me as a publisher to make decisions regarding the game and uh, there was nothing about uh, well uh, no information about the game length uh, development timeline budget team size and experience and actually your expectations from a publisher so it's not clear for me whether the game is actually available for publishing uh, what do you need from your potential partner and so on and so forth so i would recommend actually uh, not go that much into the game mechanics if you pitch to a publisher. Uh, not dig into these small details uh, because they're not typically required in the in the pitch uh, intended for publisher. At least not in that much details. That's basically my feedback. Thank you, Alec. Katie, what do you say? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for... Actually, I wouldn't call this uh, game pitch. It's more like a play session or, I don't know, like... Uh showcasing the gameplay uh, and that's exactly like it looks very cool i like the th theme of or like art setting or the style and everything um i would be actually very curious to know more about the idea of the game itself so exactly what oleg said uh about the whole pitch what is the game about where it comes from um and yeah basically my suggestion would be exactly prepare it as a pitch as a business case for the publisher because this is what we are talking about here right now um, so do some structures, some main information about platform, genre, business model, monetization, and exactly your expectations, what you're looking for, either publisher or maybe just licensor and distributor, or maybe some just connection to the store. So it's a huge difference. And I guess I don't have anything more to add here right now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And to everyone watching us in the chat, I see Nicholas is watching out on the stream. So if you also have thoughts, please share them in a stream comment section. Andre, then please, what do you think? Yeah, um, actually, I think this is the kind of game that I would play. Um, I'm not going to repeat what uh, my colleagues have said. Uh, totally agree. It was actually missing the, the actual pitch on the game. It was more like um, something that I would see a game designer uh, inside of a team would pitch to the, his colleagues, like, let's make this leveling system, and then you would go into details. That's that's almost like a pitch of, a, of the system, right? Um, but then what was missing is actually like, this something that I would open with is like the USP. What is the game about? How would you describe the game in one sentence? And something that Nicholas, you mentioned, I think in the opening, I missed the kind of game you referenced, but you said that it is the kind of game like this one, but I didn't like the ending. I'm, I don't remember if you were referring to Slave of the Spire or some other game like Heart, Hearthstone, maybe something else. But I think that that's not the ideal way of uh, ex like uh, presenting your pitch. Um, I would think of something like, let's say, looking at the game, maybe it's not the ideal example, but Slave of the Spire meets Diablo or meets Torchlight. Um, something like this would make more sense and would instantly give a... a like the, the receiver of the pitch, an idea that this is about cards, but also your the way the, you play is actually you go through the dungeons. So there's a, a quite a lot of visual reference to that. So um, I would be really starting to to build your pitch again around this, and then with all the other information that my colleagues have mentioned, that would be the ideal scenario, right? You um, open with this USP and then explain about the team, about the structure of the game. Uh, what is unique? Like uh, I especially liked how you presented the um, 
the screen of encounters. This is quite too different from what you see in Slate Aspire. So that is quite a unique thing that players would be interested in. And um, I would definitely mention that too to your publisher. So yeah, I think uh, overall, this has quite a lot of potential uh, if you just get back to the drawing board and redo this a bit. Thanks everyone. Um, Nicholas, I think it was really helpful. I hope you will improve it and we're looking forward to seeing the game. Uh, then let's move on to the next project. It's called Burn the Witch by developer Unvoid and presenter Kesha. Hi, I'm Kesha Kananichin. I'm the founder and the only permanent member of the Unvoid project. Oh. I want to present you my little bundle of emotions, Burn the Witch. All animations I draw by hand, frame by frame. All music I create myself because originally I am a musician and an, an artist. You can saw my work on Instagram. Burn the Witch was created with my programmer friend for a free day jam. But he didn't have time to finish the game. As a result, like all my projects, this game also had a difficult fate. It's one of the three projects I'm working on now, and at the moment, the most completed. But assume any gameplay development if necessary. So let me tell you more about the game and development. The launch of the game. I love this part because it's hard to underestimate the impact what such a simple part can have. I can feel how these moments can affect all the atmosphere and aesthetics of the game. Next we are greeted by a cute character, Head. He tells us what we gonna do. The main character is Ren, a member of an ancient clan that worships the abyss and sacrifices to the creatures from there. They steal people from the neighboring town and also conduct experiments on animals from the forest. The world of Bernovich is quite sad. Almost all nature is destroyed. There are no resources left, and its remains are sheltered by the witches of the forest. We are sent to destroy witch tree with our rotten heart. Only Rayon have such a black heart, and he is granted the curse of rebirth to pass this way. Only he can destroy the tree. But as adventure began, things become less clear for both main characters, Ryan and his companion Raven. Let's look at some aspects and locations of the game. After the monologue with the head of the clan, you find yourself in their house. You can hear an acoustic bass melody playing in the house and then find a cat, a musician for hire, who sits and plays it. His listeners... Among his listeners are only cockroaches. Here we can go to the clanman's attic by encarting the most ancient of them. The more victims the clan man makes to the creatures from the abyss, the more his appearance changes, up to the point where he becomes a disembodied ghost. 
When we leave the house, we enter the forest. Here I think we can move on the mechanics and how they are implemented. After killing enough enemies, Ryan can drain the blood and summoning a being from the abyss. It will ask, where are you? And how your mission is going and can help you. We see three heads on the screen representing the skills branches. Each of them can be skills up to the three times. They give different abilities like eating your enemy to restore health, summon a companion and uh, other things. In the forest, Rion and Raven will find tortured animals. So, interacting with the owl, you twist screws out of her head and heal. At the first treatment, uh, Raven and Rion notice uh, these animals can be tortured by the clansman experiments. And you can also turn into a raven if you have enough health. But aside of reconstructions of genre elements, when Rian comes back to the house second time, things start change. And even take on a different meaning. This game is not what it seems. <laughs> I could talk about the remaining projects, what I'm working on. The first project is offering. It means a lot to me, and if people were scared from the gameplay videos of Burn the Witch, this game can rightfully be really scary for them. I went through all the circles of hell during its creation. It was like everything fell on me. The betrayal of the person I believed in and made plans for the future. Illness and death of loved one. Constant fears, battles with the program and suicide attempts. All projects are dear to me, but this one have a special place in my heart. And after a year of development, I hope to release it. My program friend deleted offering twice and now I'm looking for a new one. I also suffer from a severe form of OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder and panic attacks. This thing makes life brighter. But feels at a little bit contrast. My third project is produced with an old friend programmer and it's a crazy broken glitch action. It is based on symbiotics, a deep lore and constant control of the main character from above. It also have insanely long animations, a lot of which have to do with the main character and his tense of poses. The game is colored. It was created on Ludum Dare Gem and it's very raw. My goal is to live by the game development. I eat only solar energy and if some publisher notice me or I get some funding, I will be able to keep up the game development pace and be better. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks to the watching this video. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I was deeply traumatized by this pitch in a good way. Uh, and 
let's then start with the feedback. Andre, I see you also feel some strange emotions. Help me to burn the pitch. I don't think that was a pitch. I think I felt like a... <clears throat> um, sorry, what was the guy's name? It was... Kesha. Uh, Kesha. Yeah, Kesha. I don't want to be harsh, really. Uh, I think um, I know the hardships of a, of a first game. To be honest, as a solo developer, it's really difficult. Whenever we get uh, a pitch like that, well, whenever we work with solo developers, one of the first questions we ask, do you want to help you find a team and help you like scale up a little bit? Because uh, doing this on your own is pretty difficult. No matter what kind of game you're making, it, it is it is a tough thing to do. Uh, and I'm, many of us know this firsthand. Um, so that wasn't really a pitch. I think I felt like uh, <clears throat> I'm the psychotherapist and I'm I had kind of helped somebody uh, with his game. I, I don't know how to help the best, but uh, honestly, I don't think I can judge this by the pitch uh, standards. There's obviously, it was more of a, like a person crying for help. Can you please help me somehow? Uh, like, give me an advice on what you want to do. So I think um, maybe it would be actually a good idea for Kesha, for you to chat with some other developers, I think, and uh, see how you can actually make this into a pitch and maybe to to improve your process so it's like less troublesome and all that. Yeah, so I think joining some community and, and um, chatting with them, with other developers, would make you uh, a, like, level you up quite a lot and it could become quite an interesting game. I There was different, like, the vibes of the um, Nihilumbra game and other games in the same, like, disturbed art genre. So, yeah, why not? It, it is quite, it, it looks interesting. It definitely catches the eye. Thanks, Andre. Uh, Oleg, what do you think? Yeah. Well, it was a very artistic and unusual presentation, actually, uh, just as the game itself. But again, uh, I didn't have enough information about the main game, not to mention these two extra projects which were mentioned uh, in the end. Uh, it's not clear for me, uh, is it a platformer or maybe adventure or maybe more a narrative game? Uh, I see it's a very unusual project, very original with very, again, an unusual uh, visuals, but regarding the genre and other details like the game length, development timeline, and so on and so forth, I don't have any information at all, don't have any visibility. Uh, I would recommend to concentrate more on the main game and add more details about the game itself, the gameplay, and also uh, Kesha mentioned funding, but how much, uh, how much uh, does he need? It's not clear at all. So, uh, try to make it more informative, try to make more necessary details, and then probably it will be clearer for potential uh, audience what the game's about and what uh, do you need from a potential partner. Thanks, Oleg. And Katerina, if you would pitch this game, what would you improve? Uh, thank you, Kesha, for a very artistic and very unique and customized approach how to pitch the game. Um, also agree it's more like artistic performance than a pitch. Um, yeah, a lot uh, was said already. Um, for me to add like, let's be professional. If the pitch indeed, uh, please provide the necessary information what you're looking from the publisher, what is like, uh, you mentioned that, but if you have like at least you know on the video one slide when it's written, it, it will help a lot or at least mention that. Uh, if we're talking more like in a friendly way, um, I guess Andrea was here like super, you know, uh, touch, touching and care, caring, and that's true. I guess like being in the community can help and you, maybe you will find, um, you know, somebody who will share your mindset, your outlook, and maybe you'll find another developer or I mean like programmer. Uh, that would be cool. And actually, uh, yeah, it might look very like interesting, unique, you know, something like are avant-garde in some way but i'm sure like there is a community that would like yes it's not very broad and um and wide audience but some niche product definitely and there are like such kind of publishers who would love to help you with that and also i would maybe think about some um other uh, markets like you know asian markets or japanese they have a lot of weird stuff for us weird but for them it's very interesting and popular um and yeah like I, I think I'm saying it everywhere and for everyone in terms of being structured, being precise and following some kind of um, bullet points. But yeah, well, um, 
this is no new because each publisher, everyone is looking for similar information to get understanding how it matches their focus, their strategy. So yeah, I guess uh, that's it for now. <laughs> Thanks everyone and fingers crossed for you and your projects, Kesha. Uh, let's move on to the next one. The name is Against the Storm and the developer is Ermite Games, presented by Lukasz Korzanowski. Hello everyone, my name is Luke and I'm a community manager at Aramite Games. We're a five people small indie studio from Brussels, Poland, and we're currently working on Against the Storm. Against the Storm is a roguelite city builder set in a fantasy world in which it never stops raining. In the game, you are a viceroy, a pioneer sent into the wild to build settlements inhabited by intelligent beavers, lizards, and humans. You are also tasked with gathering scars resources for the Scorched Queen. She is rebuilding the smoldering city, the only safe haven from the recurring blight storm. So how do you actually play against the storm? Well, in the core survival city building part, uh, you are going to build structures, assign workers to them, gather resources, take care of your villagers' needs. So for example, provide them with housing, food, entertainment, Etc. The goal of the game is to fill the whole reputation bar. There are a couple of ways in which you can get reputation points. So the basic one is to fulfill the scorched queen's orders. You get to pick orders by yourself. So you get to choose from one of uh, multiple orders and they will stay with you until the end of this particular game. The other way to get resources is to explore uh, the nearby glades. So we have this um, system which fans of uh, Dungeon Keeper uh, will like, that you can cut through the woods to get to the glades, which are covered with fog, so you don't really know what's in there. You can find valuable resources, uh, buildings that you can rebuild, or relics uh, that can give you some extra reputation points. But also there are threats, uh, and they are especially many of them on dangerous glades. So be careful before uh, you try to open a dangerous glade. You can find a huge drainage molder, which uh, will destroy uh, the buildings nearby. You can find a tipsy leaking cauldron that will spill uh, poison on, on resources. Third way to gather uh, reputation points is to simply um, make sure your villagers have high resolve. Getting all the reputation points usually takes around two hours. So in two hours, you will usually finish a single game, uh, get meta resources uh, for building a settlement, and then move on to the world map, uh, where you can pick your next uh, map. The world map layer consists of multiple elements. It's here where you are going to rebuild a smoldering city. You can spend meta resources on upgrades. Upgrades give you permanent bonuses, like new building blueprints, perks, etc. It's also here where you get to pick your next map. The whole world map is procedurally generated, so it looks differently for each player, and it will also reshuffle every time Blightstorm hits. Each hex tile represents a map on which you can play. Maps differ from each other in many ways. Some of the factors are uh, biomes, uh, seasons, length, uh, positive and negative effects, etc. Before embarking, you need to pick your starting bonuses. You only have a limited number of points uh, that you can spend, so choose wisely. In Against the Storm, you will never play the same game twice. I know it feels like I'm overselling, but this was one of the basic design principles uh, to make the game as replayable as possible. Hence, we added uh, roguelite elements. You are going to make a lot of choices in each game, starting with simple ones like which group of villagers to invite and ending with tougher ones like which cornerstone from the queen you're going to pick or which building. Those are the elements that really make the game replayable. Choices, perks, synergies, modifiers, meta progression, exploration. We want you to experiment with different tactics. We want you to make different decisions each game. In City Builders, you want to create production chains. 
but what if you don't have one of the buildings necessary to complete the chain because you picked another one? Or what if you don't have uh, resources because they didn't spawn on this map? Instead of production chains, we have production network. Some buildings can produce the same goods, but with different efficiency. And you can also change ingredients in recipes in case you don't have the necessary resources. You can get goods in many ways. You can find them by exploring glades, solving relics, trading with traders, establishing trade routes with the cities you created before. We believe that one of the most satisfying feelings in city builder games is when you start a new. When you create new foundations for the city, you decide what you're going to do differently this time and see how it goes. So we wanted to play on this emotion. That's why in Against the Storm, you are going to build an endless number of cities instead of one endless city. By adding roguelite elements to city builder mechanics, we wanted to create a new fresh experience for players of both genres. We hope you have fun and join us during Early Access, which starts on October 18th. May the storm be gentle on you. I like the pitch, uh, quite informative. I got information about the team, uh, about the game, main features uh, were listed. Uh, there was a gameplay video showing different game modes, USPs and uh, features. So uh, it was uh, said about the game session length. So basically I got almost everything. What I would like maybe to hear more is um, information about the team because currently the game looks quite solid. I realize it's a finished product looks very nice actually i like it i want to play it and that's why i would be it would be nice to learn more about the people behind to learn if i have any experience before if i what, what games they make uh, before we started to make uh, against the storm so basically that's that's my feedback that's probably the only thing i missed here cool thank you very much katarina have you spotted anything that missing uh, let me start with something good. Um, indeed, the game looks great. Um, I like how it looks. Um, I think I also would play this game. So great job, guys. Um, very nice, well-prepared presentation. Uh, I missed a little bit of information. So yeah, it's uh, almost early access for the game. So then um, what do you need from the publisher? Why are you pitching this game? That would be very helpful. And also just... Um, I don't know if it makes sense, but I hope it will be useful to repeat, like what kind of information usually is highly important to get into the pitch uh, for the publishers. So platforms, genre, business model, meaning free to play or premium or any other for mobile games and etc. What is the dev stage of the game? What is the budget with which you need and for what? Uh, what is the dev time to finish the development if it's not finished? What do you expect from the publisher, yeah, like marketing, PR, QA localization? co-publishing for other markets, like the different stuff which publishers are providing. So it's okay. And actually you need to put it into your pitch, what you expect from them, what kind of support. Talk about your team, your experience, exactly like Oleg said, what kind of games did you develop in the, in the past, um, what are noble things. So that also shows your expertise and it's important. Then you can see, uh -huh, if you had already successful, successful games in this genre, then potentially and probably you will also bring another successful game in the similar genre. And this is also very important to bring some kind of uh, reliability on the development team, especially if they just start to work with this publisher, like a new one, a new partner. Uh, competitive analysis also is cool with some USPs, why you decided to make this game and what is unique about this game comparing to previous similar ones. And yeah, monetization, if anything is besides, like of course for free to play games, obviously, and uh, yeah, if it's premium, some DLC plans and etc. Because it's very cool to see uh, the core game loop, and it's um, especially for the guys who are uh, like a super nerdy players in a good way. That's amazing. Uh, but, but from the business side, it's also very important to have all of this information. And just I hope it will be useful for you in the future. But yeah, about uh, the game, thank you very much. Yeah, only one information which was missing for me. What do you expect from the publisher? Otherwise, it's a really great pitch. Thank you. I hope every other cast instance was also making notes for this feedback. But yet again, Andre, what's your... Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Luca, for the pitch. Uh, full disclosure, uh, we've already seen this game. 
I think about a year ago, uh, you guys have pitched to us and I, I played the build, so it was really new to me. Um, I maybe would believe that for, for some people who are seeing this for the first time, maybe the um, gameplay explanation was maybe a, a little too deep, when it, especially when it came to global map and its features. Um, but something, and by the way, really great job on the video. Like when you talk about the game and the supporting videos are really cool. Like the jump between like close-ups and global map and the like, uh, village view, it's really great. Um, I think that's what uh, was my, how the game was interesting to us in the first place. One thing I would maybe recommend here is that instead of just talking about the game in general, it would be great and maybe more impactful on on the on the receiver of the pitch to compare, like show how the game is unique um, uh, compared to other games in the genre because this genre is quite. Um, competitive right now. And I know that you guys actually have a lot of unique features. And instead of just telling uh, how the game is, I would just pick a few things, like five key things that are different from other games, including not only mechanics, but even like the setting. I know that you have three unique races, which are unique. Like one of them is Armadillo, the other one is elves, and somebody else like humans. To me, this was like, wow, this is cool. There's going to be something in the lore of the game that would make me play. So things like that, I would put them up front and show them uh, as like, this is how we're different from other games in the genre. So that is useful. Um, and um, yeah, I, otherwise I think uh, Katrina and Oleg has already uh, described what was missing, like what you need from a publisher, knowing that the game is, is already going to be released pretty soon uh, into early access. Um, because at this point, for example, for us, uh, we're usually not getting involved in the in the stage, right? Uh, but then maybe there's something where we could theoretically help, right? Um, so yeah, um, thank you again for the for the pitch. I'm really hoping to play the game when it's out. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you everyone. That was Against the Storm from Aramide Games. Check it out on Epic Store. Uh, and our final project for today is Two Against the Legion by the developer UFO Cat Games and presenter Nydena Fartyom. Hello, my name is Artem. Uh, I am a solo indie game developer and I'm glad to present you my game called Two Against the Legion. Two Against the Legion is a cooperative local multiplayer adventure puzzle game for two players in which you have to defeat rebellious robots and prevent a technological disaster. The players have completely different game experiences. The main features are that it can be played by two people on one device and the way it is implemented. Each player sees his part of the puzzles from his own angle and has a unique set of basic skills. The game is presented as a split screen. Player 1 sees the game in a third person view and controls the character using the keyboard. He can fight with robots and physically interact with the game world. Player 2 plays with a top down view and controls the character with the mouse. He hacks various electronics and helps player 1 with navigation. The fun of the game is achieved through the active interactions of players with each other. They have to work together by communicating and describing what they see in order to solve the puzzles. In the build which I sent to Game Hub, there is a prototype of the online mode, but in final version I decided to remove it and leave only a local one. The reason is that the entire game is designed for split screen. Besides, Steam and PlayStation allow people to play local games over the network using their remote play services. Who is game for? It's for people who like to play cooperative games, for lovers of quests and puzzles, for people who like unusual indie games. Target platforms. Primary the PC, but I do not exclude the possibility of porting the game to popular consoles. Next steps and plans. I decided to leave the game pretty much as it is now and just polish the visuals and optimize the code so it looks juicy, attractive and enjoyable to play. By saying as it is now, I mean the number of puzzles and the amount of time players will spend in the game. After that, uh, step is game promoting. Next step is game releasing. 
If the game will be warmly received by players and bring some income, I plan to expand my one-man team to four and start developing the next game, also a cooperative puzzle game, but fully networked. What this pitch is for? I'd like to make a statement about me and my game, I'd like to get feedback and to find a publisher to promote and port the game. Uh, that's all, thank you very much for your attention, goodbye. Well, here's all the recap of the info and it was quite concise, so let's now discuss. Katerina, please start. <laughs> Okay, yeah, um, it was quite uh, precise and uh, well structured, which I love a lot, as we already understood. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, like maybe a little bit, add a little bit of passion, um, but I think it was um, well done enough. Um, maybe I missed information about uh, the budgets uh, for the game, um, so this is what I missed. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, like. The gameplay was shown, I saw also the developer, he made a very structured, precise information. I don't have any more um, comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katie. Andre, what do you think? Um, I think this time around we have to choose, like, not the best pitch, but the, the most um, promising pitch, I think. So, because if, if we were to choose the best one, I think that would be my winner. Um, and I, I think we'll have a hard, hard time choosing one because this was uh, like actually the best pitch I've seen in, in a long time. Um, maybe there was like some information was maybe missing as like, um, let's say uh, how much of a gameplay there is and um, like how like maybe some unique mechanics, some unique puzzles, um, because these would be the ones that I would show the players if I were to uh, uh, announce this and show the game in a trailer. Um, but otherwise, literally, I think this is the least feedback I would give to a pitch because it was it was pretty spot on. It was everything. It was really compact. Uh, the the supporting video was really good to show what the um, uh, what the developer was talking about. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the name. Um, so honestly, I wish I could advise here something, but it was pretty spot on. Thanks. That was uh, that was great. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Artem, I hope you're listening. Uh, and Oleg, um, what do you think? Well, thank you, Artem. Uh, it was brief, but very informative pitch. Actually, as Andre mentioned, uh, basically almost everything were listed there, even though it was just uh, maybe two, three minutes, but it was enough to give uh, the main information about the game, about the length, genre, platforms, next steps and plans. Uh, even the game price was mentioned and expectations from publisher, which is really good. Uh, I would maybe... Uh, I would maybe recommend you to add more information about yourself. Is that your first game or uh, have you worked on uh, other games before? Uh, maybe more information about game features, USPs, and uh, something about the game development length. When did you start the development? Something like that. But apart from that, everything's clear. So pretty good one. Thank you. Okay. To avoid the confusion, I will remind you again that this time we are picking the pitch that has the most room to grow. So uh, the pitch that we choose today will have to, within the next three weeks until the finals of the public pitch, uh, will have to prepare and avoid all the mistakes that they made today. Uh, so uh, if you, Andre, decided to reconsider, it will be okay. Uh, now, please, people in the chat, uh, also voice who is your contestant of the day. And yeah, please then let's start back with Oleg. Oleg, who do you think will have the most time to grow and really improve the pitch uh, from here on out? I think it's School of Magic from uh, Nicholas because, you know, uh, the concept is really good. It's interesting. And Nicholas gave a lot of information about the gameplay and the, ga the game itself. But there was basically nothing about uh, his, expectations, his expectations from a publisher, uh, development timeline, budget, team size, and so on, so on, so on. So he actually has a lot of opportunities to make it a real pitch rather than, you know, not just a gameplay video describing the main game features. Okay, thanks. Andre, still with two against the Legion? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, <clears throat> again, because I have to, this is, I don't know, this is new to me, right? The choosing the, not the, the best pitch as usual, but the one with the best room to grow. I think I would agree with Alec. Um, when I look at all, all four of them, I think School of Magic, in my in my head at least, it has the best pos- possibility. It has the best opportunity to grow, right? If, if you will actually, Nicholas, if you were to uh, choose the structure of it and put a much like a just one minute or two minutes on the game and then like all the other things uh, that we asked for uh, it could become a perfect pitch so ideally i would like to see that so and the last one katarina i mean i i will not change the the, the mind uh, or like give something else i also totally agree with guys um the first game is definitely the one that actually i would like to see in the uh, finale let's say uh how the developer will change a little bit and update the pitch because we saw the gameplay now i'm actually very curious what they can do um and improve in terms of proper pitch and if you need any advice or suggestions you can uh, write to me i will be happy to help but also i can suggest you to just uh google i know that um, actually uh in tiny build uh, i'm sure on the website there is a very good article i guess alex uh, made it several years ago perfect uh, instructions of how to pitch the game also Rafiu was doing uh some articles about how to pitch the game so just uh, prepare better and uh, see you at finale all right yeah. then unanimously uh, school of magic by developer part-time indie and nicholas creasy pack your slides and see you in finals um before wrapping it up i will just tell you see you next wednesday on october 27 here again on youtube uh, follow public pitch updates of devgum social media and see the leaderboard of all the projects on devgum's website the link is in the description right here okay any Final wishes for the, all the developers who didn't made it? No, I think I'm good. Um, actually, I, we've just, uh, thank you, Katarina, for mentioning that article. We've recently updated it. So anyone who is interested, take a look. It's uh, it's tinybuild.com, how to beach games. Um, yeah, actually, I'd love for all the developers to just, uh, not just this one, but there's quite a lot of information. Um, yeah, even if you look back to other public pitches at DevGam, that's a really nice initiative. Thanks, DevGam team, for doing this. Uh, there's a lot of info on how to make it quite a great pitch. Um, okay, and also, I think I saw maybe on DTF, uh, Guide to, pub- to Pitching from Meta Publishing. So definitely also check it out. Yes, yes, yes. We also prepared our own guide. So please go and check it, and I hope it will be helpful for you. Exactly. See, there are so many information everywhere about this from different publishers. So just read this information and make up your own, you know, customized, unique idea of how you see that based on this information. And yeah, good luck to everyone. What you're doing is great. And yeah, let's game. Stay with us, watch DevGam updates, and see you next time.